Across the Obelisk is a roguelike, card-based RPG developed by Dreamsight Games. This game has me addicted, and this review is my way of explaining why, while also giving critique where it is due. I'm also hoping to spread the word about it as I think this game is worthy to grace the Steam library if anybody remotely interested in roguelike card games such as Slay the Spire, or even regular digital card games like Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. Alright, enough of the intro, let's get to the reason you're here. So let's start off with what I believe is the weakest aspect of Across the Obelisk, the sound design. At the current time of writing this, the game is still in early access, and so I will be going off the information I currently have. If there are any changes, I will note them either in the video, the description, or both. The music is nice, but can get old pretty fast. There are only a few different songs, and they repeat often, so as somebody who has spent over 200 hours in the game, I normally mute the music and play my own in the background. That being said, I have already noticed a couple of new songs added into the mix, so hopefully this won't be an issue for long. Sound effects are also a bit lacking, but less so. I don't find myself complaining too much about the character attacks unless I'm playing a bard build, as the songs are mostly basic and some of them share their sound, which seems wrong to me. However, this does seem to be another area that they are working on. Since starting to write this review, they have actually already added a couple more sound effects for the songs, so we are getting closer. All this aside, however, my biggest complaint, and something I think could go very far with this game, is narration of the story elements. You don't have to have the whole game voice acted, but some of the story nodes on the maps would be much more involving with the narrator. As of right now, the only voice in the game is the narration in the starting screenplay. This game is really good aesthetically, in my opinion of course. The characters and maps are all well designed and I really like them. The only real complaint is that Act 4 doesn't seem as unique and colorful as the other areas and ends up feeling kind of grey and lifeless. But that very well could be the point for reasons I won't explain to keep spoilers to a minimum. If I had to be nitpicky, I would say that the enemies could use a little more variety to set themselves apart from others of a similar type, but all in all, it's not something I find myself complaining about. I do think as far as character designs, they could use a few more female units. Playable characters are kind of heavy on the male side, with there only being 4 of the 16 that are female. Again, not something I find to be a huge issue, but as I prefer to play female characters, it is something that I feel needs to be mentioned. The card system is the bread and butter of this game and what keeps me coming back for hours on end. There are enough cards and different effects to make numerous different builds. With all my time put into the game, there are still many deck ideas I have, but haven't tried yet. However, this comes at a price. The game has quite a difficulty curve for those inexperienced in similar titles. If you're like me and came from Slay the Spire, it has a few similarities that make it a little bit easier to adjust. I also watched my brother play several runs before I played, so I already had an idea of what to expect. Therefore, any complaints about new player difficulty are what I have heard from those around me, and not my own personal experience. So I guess the message here is that an improved tutorial might be necessary to make it more inviting to people new to the game style. That being said, once you get the hang of it, it's really easy to get caught up in the number of things you can do. Each class has their own unique set of cards that they can unlock, and that can be refined down even more by each character having their own specialties. However, I'll speak more about this later. I'll try to breeze through a very brief explanation of how the system works. If anyone wants a more in-depth explanation, let me know in the comments and maybe I can put together a tutorial myself. You have a potential of 10 energy you can build up, and you generate 3 energy per turn. You spend this energy on the cards in your deck, which you can see the cost at the top left of each card. There are many types of cards such as attack, 
defend, skill, etc., which you can see at the bottom of each card. However, there are a few unique outliers that seem to count as multiple types, but that's a little too complicated to explain right now. The box in the bottom half of the card is where you will find its full effect. This section was longer than I hoped, but I think it was necessary for those who are new. The party makeup is another huge customization option for the players that just adds even more to the replayability of the game. There are four character classes and four characters in each class, bringing their own unique flavor to the mix. Tanks absorb heavy amounts of damage, taunt enemies, and set up blocks to prevent their allies from taking too much damage. Scouts are your physical DPS, whether it's bows, swords, or knives. They stick the pointy end into the enemy until they're no longer a problem. Mages, your magical DPS, they burn, freeze, electrocute, or suck the soul out of everything in their path. Last but not least, you have your healers, who do exactly that. They make sure your party stays upright for long enough that the enemy drops first. One cool thing about this game is that you're not restricted to a specific party makeup. They have recommendations, but nothing is required other than unlocking the characters. You also can't have multiple instances of the same character at the same time but that's understandable. Each character has their own set of talents that set them completely apart from the others of their class. Every character also has a perk tree that is the same for all characters. You can pick your path in this and customize to your heart's content. The only restriction to this is that you do have a limited amount of points to use. Some perks also require more than one point to unlock and a minimum number of points to proceed to the next tier on the tree, the amount of which you can see on the left hand side. Perhaps, in my opinion, the most amazing thing about this game is how the multiplayer works. It's so simple, yet this game seems to do what so many other games fail to. You simply set up a lobby between one and four players, you can make it either public or private. Then the host assigns the party positions to each player in the game. Then people just pick their character and go. Simple as that. If someone has to go, the game saves and exits. But if you want to continue without them, you can just load up the same game, assign someone to take over the person's spot who is being replaced, then go back in and continue from where you left off. Easy peasy. Another amazing thing about this game is that there are reasons for playing both multiplayer and single player. You aren't hugely rewarded for doing one more than the other. If you are in single player mode, you'll earn all the rewards for that game when you win or lose but you are responsible for gearing up everyone yourself. Whereas in multiplayer, you split the cost and reward of gearing up your characters in proportion to how many characters you are using in the party. So if you were playing with one friend, two characters each, the reward would be 50-50. The cost could technically be more or less depending on who you are playing and what your build is. Each time you win or lose a game, you are given a chest of gems and gold based on your score when the game ended. You can store up to three of these chests at a time and use them in any game, multiplayer or not, in any city unless you are playing on a higher difficulty that does not allow chests to be used. You can even share some of that loot with a less fortunate friend in a multiplayer game. Only complaint I have about this is that you can only go up to increments of 100 at max. I can sometimes be giving my allies thousands of gems or gold and have to mash my mouse button a bajillion times to do so. You can spend this gold and gems on building your character. Gold is used to pay for divinations, which are basically just random card packs. It seems to use the same table as battles, with the higher cost divinations giving you a higher chance at rarer cards. You can also use gold to buy items to equip to your characters and give them additional passive benefits. Lastly, you can spend gold to remove cards to a minimum of 15 from your deck. You can spend gems on cards that you have already unlocked through progression and divinations so that you can essentially build a deck from the ground up using your favorite cards. There is a limitation to how many there are available for a single card per character to purchase, however there is no limit that I know of to how many copies of a single card are in a character's deck. But there is also a handy section that you can go to to save a deck that you like then you can load that deck list on a later playthrough. 
You do still have to pay for it, just like normal, but it saves a bunch of time going through the same cards over and over again when you are going through repeated playthroughs and want to use a specific deck. This feature is only available in the first town, and I do not know if they intend to extend it beyond, but it is still a huge quality of life feature. While on the subject of quality of life, there is an export and import option for the perk loadouts as well that I forgot to talk about earlier. This game is a roguelite, and as such, has similar features to other roguelites. It has several different paths on multiple maps, and even has some RNG elements that can spawn on those maps, of which some have options with difficulty checks, which is a challenge that requires you to get above or below a certain number that is dictated by the energy cost of your cards. The game does tell you the odds of your success based on what it reads in your deck. Sometimes it's for a single character, sometimes for the party, all depending on the event in question. The paths all lead to the same boss, but can take you into other areas of the map, including little sub-areas with many bosses. The branching paths are very similar to Slate Aspire in that there isn't a huge number of branches, and the basic fights are very similar. However, each path does have unique events that only spawn in that specific path, and even some that have unique interactions with specific characters. In traditional roguelite fashion, the game is nearly impossible to defeat on your first try unless you are incredibly lucky. You will be repeating the various maps many, many, many times. However, with the number of customization options available, it never feels like quite the same run every time. You can also run into corrupted fights, which give you options of huge rewards at the cost of increasing the difficulty of the fight based on how incredible said reward is. It can be as little as the option to remove or upgrade cards in your deck for free, all the way up to a thousand of each golden gems. The gold and gem rewards are divided among party members if you are playing in multiplayer, and it is also based on how many characters you are playing. One is a quarter, two is a half, and three is three quarters. You really need to pay attention to the enemy buffs, however, because some are much harder than others. Word of advice, do not play missions with the Sub-Zero modifier unless your damage capability is good enough to knock out at least two enemies by the end of turn two. This game is incredible, and it gives me literally everything I want in a game. Hours upon hours of content, cooperative play, and huge amounts of customization. It has almost a D&D &D feel while using cards instead of dice. It definitely has its flaws, but they are so very small in comparison to the benefits, and also something that the devs could even fix later on down the line should they feel it worth the cost. The game can be a bit jarring with all the customization to players that are new to the game, but it's much simpler than it appears at first glance. At the time of posting this video, the game is available entirely for a single cost and does not appear to even hint at possible microtransactions. It's very sad to say, but at this point in time with how common they are, this has to be said as a boon. I am looking forward to potential DLC and would love to even see workshop content if the devs allow it. Again, if anyone would like to see anything explained in more detail, either in tutorial form or just an explanation, I would love to hear about it in the comments. I would like to show this game some more love, just need to know if anybody is interested in that. If you liked this video, consider giving it a like and leave a comment. This is the first review I've ever done and would love to hear feedback as to how I can improve. But let's keep it constructive, yeah? Until next time, have a wonderful day.